Yeah, put that in, yeah. Good morning. It's a fantastic to, to be here today. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. So, so my, my name is Ben Holliday. Uh, it's great to be here in Manchester. And um, I just thought, actually, let's start there. So Manchester is very much a city of design. And it's, I actually think it's fantastic we're here. I first came to study design here in Manchester, and it was because of designers like Peter Saville, who hopefully, I hope that you know who Peter Saville is, but I thought I'd start with this uh, really fantastic quote. And this is Peter Saville talking about the city of Manchester and the culture here. And the way we live is our culture, and the role of designers is to contribute to the way we live. And really, uh, the thing I want to think about today is actually, you know, is what we're working on actually contributing to the way we live? How is it helping the way we live? And I want to talk about how digital products actually should be helping people get on with their lives. So thank you for the introduction before. Um, hopefully you all know this website by now. Hopefully you've all used it. So a little bit about me. I, I went to work with the Government Digital Service about 14 months ago. I now work for the Department of Work and Pensions, so I'm still working really closely with them. Um, really, I'm just helping research, design, and deliver digital services, and I'm doing that with, with, with teams across government at the moment. The bit that I've been really interested in and the bit that I've been specifically working with is digital transformation. So you probably know about gov.uk, which is bringing together lots of different government websites into one place so it's simpler, clearer, and faster for users. But the next thing that we're doing is we're starting to build digital services that also belong on gov.uk. So services and transactions for people to come to gov.uk so they can access different things. We started doing that by building 25 of these. And at the moment, we're working on this towards next April, so April 2015. And these are spread across government departments, so everywhere from HMRC through to DVLA through to the Department of Work and Pensions. And you can see that they're all at different stages at the moment. I'm going to talk about one in particular this morning, just because it's where I've been working quite a lot the last year. And this is a service called Carers Allowance. And it's financial support for people that are caring for somebody for 35 hours or more a week. And this is actually a really important service, and I will talk more about this. And if you think about it, we probably all know somebody who's been a carer, and actually most of us will care for somebody at some point in our lives, or we'll need somebody to care for us. So it's been a really interesting service to research and design, and be part of the team delivering this. So the way we develop uh, services now as part of gov.uk very much works like this. So we start with user needs, and I'm going to talk more about that later. Then we go for a discovery, so we try and make sure we're building the right things. And then we go for an hour for a beta, and hopefully we get services through to live. And this particular service uh, we've had in live beta since last October, so we've been working on it in a live environment for the last 12 months. So this is actually how digital services used to look. So as you can see, they weren't that great. So this is uh, nine years ago, the Department of Work and Pensions launched this. Um, it had very low take up over its life cycle. I don't think it had been updated for seven years up until the point that the new service launched last year. It had low completion rates and it didn't work on mobile and tablet. And probably one of the key things is it also had over 300 questions. So it was really difficult to get through this transaction. It was a lot of work to get a fairly small amount of financial support as a carer. So the team did a fantastic job in Preston. This is before I went and worked with them. So Lee Mortimer and his team in Preston delivered this last October. So this is part of gov.uk, so a brand new way of applying for carers allowance online, which is fantastic. And then this is kind of where we are now. So uh, this October, you can see that it's changed quite a lot again, and it's all part of just continuous improvement. Uh, digital take-up has now gone from about 20%, 25%, and right up to 50%, 60%. Over a third of the people that visit this transaction uh, are now on mobile or tablet as well. It's really important that actually we build for mobile first. And the service is just vastly improved for its users. And like I said, it's all part of continuous improvement. So hopefully you're really familiar by now with this thing of build, measure, and learn. And that's kind of the center of everything we've done. So it wasn't just about getting a service live. It was actually getting a service live and looking at how we can improve it, looking at how we can meet user needs better. So all of this hangs off the design principles. So if you're familiar with GDS, hopefully you've seen these design principles before. And uh, even if you've not seen these design principles, I hope that as, as UX people, actually you would know that actually the importance of having design principles in your project. So not necessarily a set of rules that we follow. 
but actually a set of foundations that we can build on and that we can go back to that will help us focus on building the right products in the right ways. And these have been really the most important part of designing services within government, working on carers allowance and working with my colleagues and all the other exemplars that we've got running in government as well at the moment. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these today. And obviously the first and the most important one is to always start with user needs. And the way we talk about user needs is we talk about the, actually we need to understand and design for the needs of users, not for the needs of government. And the way I like to explain this and focus in on this, and this is where actually where people have situations in their lives where they need something. So we need to start with what they need to do. And if you go back to that product cycle I showed you before, actually the important thing is that we start with discovery. So we start with trying to understand what the real need is, the reason we're building the service, what that service needs to look like. So the types of services that I work on now, they're more along the needs of, actually, I need financial support to care for somebody. Or maybe I need financial support to cover the cost of living independently because I've got a disability or I've got an illness. Or I need to find a job, so I need help doing that. Or I need financial support because of that so I can support my family. And actually, what we found, just going out and talking to people and just get, trying to get alongside real users as we develop these services, is most people don't want to be dependent on the government. They don't want to be dependent on our services. Actually, they want to get on with their lives. So somebody who talks really well, I think explains user needs really well, uses some different terminology, but it's a really good place to start, is Clay Christensen. And uh, he's written some good books and some good videos of him talking about this that you should check out. And um, he explains it more in the context of selling products and marketing products. But he talks about how actually people don't buy products because of demographics. They actually go about living their life and then they have a situation. So we have a situation in our lives where something like a problem arises and then we need to solve that problem. And the important thing is actually when we're designing, you know, the thing we're designing is actually the thing that should be letting them do that job, the thing that should be solving that problem. And Clay Christian says actually if you can understand the job, how to improve the product actually becomes obvious. So the thing we're starting with user needs is we don't define or create them. We have to understand them because they already exist. They're already there. They're real problems in people's lives. So they're not the kind of things we make up that we're going to build. They're not products we think up. We actually try and understand and identify that underlying need. So I think it raises a couple of really interesting questions. So first of all, it's just do people need or want to use your product or service? So if you're, if you're actually building something that you're trying to sell to people, is there actually a need that's going to mean that people buy it? Or actually, if we're developing a service for government, is there a need for that service that's actually going to solve a problem in people's lives? And really, that leads me on to this bigger question of actually, does what we're working on, does the solution, does the design that we're working on help people get on with their lives? And actually, I think that good digital services, they should help people get on with life. And that's no matter how complex or difficult their situations might be. Like with what I've just been talking about, their lives might have been turned upside down. Somebody they know might have just become serious and well. You can imagine your own life if something, you know, has really just changed that's kind of upset everything. Somebody could have been in an accident. But you can see, actually, we don't want to be designing things that get in the way when, when people actually need to access digital services. It kind of... I think there's some responsibility with this, and this is especially so with what we're doing in government at the moment. So it's not really about engaging an audience if we're designing for needs. We've got to be trying to solve the right problems. We're not building websites where we're trying to get people to spend time on them just for the sake of it, or just so we can kind of get them to engage with us. Actually, we really want to meet those needs. And actually, if we do that well, people will trust us and they'll come back and they'll use more digital services online. Gov.uk do this really well, and I'm sure you've heard people speak about this before, but it's about understanding that if people come to this website, they don't want to browse, they don't want to just hang out there. Actually, they want information, they want the answer to a question. And what I like about what the team on Gov.uk delivered is actually they're willing to sacrifice some of the elegance if it helps people get things done in terms of the way they design things. They try and understand the need on every page and try and get people the information that they need or they try and get people to the service as quickly as possible. And um, I think the key thing really is that people don't want the product or service, they want the outcome. And it's important that we're focused on outcomes. So I think the question is really always, what can we do to get out of the way? No matter what we're working on, what can we do to get out of the way from what people need to do? 
So I don't want to be that person that's designing digital products based on everything that I've just shown you that actually start to get in the way of real life. It's a case of what can we do to get out of the way when people need to access financial support? Or actually, can we make things simple when the underlying systems are actually really inherently complex? We're having to build on really complex policy in government around some of these things we're delivering. And to give you an example, if we go back to carer's allowance, one of the things we discovered really early on was just around the time that carers have. And uh, we found, we went out and we did quite a lot of user research early on and we went and spoke to a lot of carers. We did quite a lot of work here in Manchester with carers' organisations. And we just discovered, and it seems obvious now, but there's this real user need that as a carer, actually, I've got really limited time because actually I'm caring for somebody. I've actually got limited time because I'm going to have to stop what I'm doing every 10, 20 minutes and actually go and provide some care. Or actually, if I've got somebody in a difficult situation, I'm not going to be able to leave them for, for very long. And that's a really clear user need for this service. And we really believe now that we're not here to take up any more of their time than is absolutely necessary. So we've been prioritizing work for the last year to try and reduce the time it takes to complete the transaction, to make it as clear and concise and fast as possible. So the average time to completion for this is now about 25 minutes. We still think that could be a lot better, and part of that continuous iteration is we'll keep doing work to try and improve that. But what we can do is prioritize changes, come up with hypotheses and designs that we think will make it faster and work with those. But the key thing is we've made it 10 minutes on average less to apply for this than it was 12 months ago. And that might not seem that much, but as an average, that is quite significant with quite a lot of changes. And when you amount that to the amount of time that saves a week, that's about 500 hours of carer's time that we're not taking up on our digital service. And it's that thing about engagement again. It's actually, we don't want their time. We just want to get them access to the outcome. So that really takes me on to the, the main kind of thing I want to talk about today, which is this idea of do less, which is also the second design principle. And I think it really, um, if we start with user needs, this is the big question, is actually what can we do to get out of the way? What can we do? Can we do less? Because actually, what if doing less actually makes things better? So I've done quite a lot of reading on this and just thinking about actually maybe are there ways that we can do less as designers, as UX people, to actually create better products? And I came across this really interesting guy called uh, Hans Mondeman. And he was a Dutch traffic engineer. And uh, he famously said, actually, the trouble with traffic engineers is that whenever there's a problem with a road, whenever there's congestion, whenever they're trying to solve a problem, they always try and add something. And he actually went on to say, to my mind, it's actually always better to think about what we can remove. And um, Hans Mondeman was really interested in that he came up with this idea of a shared space. So he was from the Netherlands. And in a town in the Netherlands, he actually did this experiment where they decided they, would, they had a really congested town centre. And as an experiment, they said, well, actually, we're going to remove all the traffic lights, all the traffic signs, and all the road markings. And uh, everybody thought he was crazy at the time. So the majority of people thought it'd end up in chaos. It'd be terrible. There'd be cars crashing into each other. You know, people would just keep acting exactly the same. But without the constraints of things like traffic lights, it just wouldn't work. But actually, the results were the opposite of what most people expected. So the traffic actually moved slower. People paid more attention. And accidents ultimately declined. And you're probably really familiar with this now. This is actually, this photo here is actually from Preston, where we've been delivering this project, where they're building a shared space in the town centre. They've taken away all the signage. It's all kind of big pavements and single lanes for cars, and everybody kind of gives way. And we see this across Europe now, but it's this idea that actually maybe doing less can be better. Maybe it can solve the problem. A way I've actually started to illustrate this is this idea of an inverted U. So to explain the inverted U, uh, if you think about user needs being, a, being this thing on the left, as you can see up here. So when we start, we start down in the bottom left. So when we start building a product, we haven't met user needs. And as we start creating, as we start designing the right things, the right features, we start to meet user needs. And you can see as we do that, this, this U, the line, it starts to climb. So the more features and the more design, the more content we add, we start to meet user needs better. But the really interesting thing is eventually you get to this flat middle. So we're in the middle. And actually, the changes we make, the features we add, they start to make little or no difference. And actually, I think that idea is really interesting. I've seen that on products that I've worked on. We get to the point where we think we're adding, really, we're adding real value. We're coming up with new ideas that we think are going to help drive some of our key metrics or improve the user experience. And actually, it doesn't seem to do that. 
But then beyond that, it gets even more interesting because actually what if adding more things actually makes it worse? And I think we've all been there. We get to the point where we're adding things and it's making no difference. We think, well, actually, maybe we need to add some more features. Maybe we need to add more content to explain that thing. And actually, we see that we start to meet user needs less because we're adding more content. We're over-explaining things. We're adding features that actually make the product less usable. And uh, it's worth saying I took this idea originally from a book called David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell. He doesn't talk about it in terms of product design, but he explains it really well if you want to go and read that. But he says inverted U curves are all about limits. So it's understanding that actually as designers, constraints are important and understanding constraints. But inverted U curves, they illustrate the fact that more isn't always better. So I think if we start to think about products and services in this way, actually we can start to ask some really interesting questions. So what if, past a certain point, actually adding more features actually does make little or no difference? So this is just an example from Carers Allowance. It's a really common example from different government transactions that I've seen and some of my colleagues at GDS were working on at the time. And we had lots of different progress bars on different transactions. And we were questioning, actually, why do we really need these progress bars? And uh, we wanted to say, actually, could we just test, or is there a way of seeing if, we, if these are just superfluous features? Do they really help us meet user needs? So the assumption really is to meet user needs that people need a progress indicator so they can complete the transaction. You know, the high level user need is actually I need to be able to complete this transaction to, so I can apply for carer's allowance and get financial support. So we thought, well, add, we designed this progress bar so people can complete the transaction. But as an experiment, actually, we tried to frame things like this as a hypothesis. So we said, well, actually, well, maybe we believe that if we remove the progress bar, it's not going to affect completion rates. And the only way we're going to know that's true is if we run an experiment, take it away, and then we actually measure what happens. So we see if completion rates stay the same. And just before I show you what happened, actually, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about how we measure some of these things. So as well as going, we make user research part of all of our work through GDS and throughout government now. So we try and run lab-based research. We're constantly out meeting real users, testing real working prototypes or real products with people. The other thing we do in a live service, so I talked about this being in a live beta, is we'll try and make changes to the live product and test in live, and we'll look at key metrics. So it's really important that we focus on metrics that matter, so we don't just measure everything. And uh, the term metrics that matter has been around for a while. Is, uh, they do a really good job of explaining it in the Lean, UX, um, the Lean UX Analytics book, which is part of that Lean UX series, which is worth reading if you're interested in this. Uh, in government, we broadly have four or five kind of key KPIs that we publish on gov.uk. So we go from digital take up to things like completion rates to user satisfaction, which is a little bit like an NPS score, which kind of we get a percentage of people are 90% satisfied with this service. To, to things like I've talked about how important time to completion is as a key metric for this particular service. So these are all data points that actually change over time, and they change depending on how well the service meets user needs or how well the things we've designed are actually enabling people to use the service. I've actually written a blog about this to explain it a bit more. But we know that we're meeting the needs of carers, for instance, if we're adding a feature that will remove a barrier and then completion rates go up. If we add that feature with the hypothesis that we think that's going to make it easier for them to complete their transaction, actually maybe completion rates will go down and we'll know that we've done the wrong things. So we can take that feature out and do something else. It's the same with time to completion. Actually, we can say, well, we believe that if we make this change to this workflow, if we redesign these screens, we'll believe it will get faster. And we can look at the average time of completion and we can actually validate whether those changes are helping us to meet user needs better. But to go back to the progress bar example, actually what was interesting is completion rates stayed exactly the same when we removed the progress indicator. No difference whatsoever. No difference to time to completion. We couldn't find any real difference in user behavior. In fact, when we'd gone and done user research with the progress indicator, we'd even found most people weren't noticing it was there in the first place. So we decided to leave it out because there was no evidence that it was really adding value in terms of meeting user needs. What we have found is we've had some feedback with people just telling us, Actually, it'd be great to know just how many pages there are, because I want to know how far I am for the end. So we've now iterated, and we include this section kind of 2 of 10, 1 of 10 instead, which feels more like the appropriate solution. But the important thing is it felt like this progress bar was in that flat middle. It wasn't really helping the service. It wasn't really helping users. And we've done a lot of similar things. So this is a good example, because it shows the progress bar, and it shows what we call smart answers, which are a really common design pattern on Gov UK. 
where we play back uh, answers you've already given with little links to change them. And actually, because of how we structured this, we found that these weren't being very helpful. And when we tested with people that were less confident online, we found actually they were getting confused by these because they weren't familiar with the design pattern. So again, we took them away and we found actually it made no difference to some of those high-level metrics. And it also made no difference when we tested the service with real users. So we'd rather have a service that's clean and clear and faster to use because actually we don't need some of these features. So I've talked a little bit about features, but what if we apply that to content? And it's, it's similar. So what if past a certain point, actually adding more content makes something less clear? This is something that I've, I've hit upon in kind of different projects over the years. And we do it a lot with help text. So I just wanted to show you this example. So with first name, we used to say, enter your first name as shown on your birth certificate or passport. And that was because we were a bit worried that actually maybe people, like if my name is Benjamin, I'd just write Ben, and that might because we have to cross-match records on systems after we get, we get these transactions coming through, it could cause problems. But actually, in user research, time after time, we were finding because of that help text, people were entering their full name into first name, realizing and having to go back and take out the, their surname. So it was just wasting people's time, and it was just confusing people a bit. So it's one of those, again, we just found that maybe if we take it out, it will be better. And testing it now, it just, it's not tripping people up anymore. And actually looking at the live data coming through, people are kind of getting it. And generally people, because they know it's a financial transaction, they're applying for money, they will enter their details accurately. So really it's about the small details sometimes and finding the small areas where you can do less as well, because those sort of small details do matter. And I just wanted to make the point that really it's easier to discover what to add than what to remove. Um, one of the teams that are working on uh, transactions in government are a team working on Register to Vote. They're now a live service. So over a million people have registered to vote online on gov.uk now. And one of the things they found is they had lots of help text, but they deliberately removed it before they went out to do user research. And that was really important because actually that way they found out if people really did have the difficulties that they predicted. And they've since been able to add it, re add in some of the help text, but based on real evidence. So they could see the proportion of people with problems, they could see what those problems were, and they could actually add content that really did help meet that user need. So I want to move on a little bit to thinking about how we design with things like security and fraud in mind, and this idea of doing less. I've actually started seeing some really good examples of doing less just, just in the real world as well. So now I've been thinking about this. And I really like this example because I don't know, you know that thing where you go and you pass like a pound shop and there's now a cardboard cutout of the policeman in the window? And this was Preston the other week and you can see there's actually the, uh, the policeman stood in the background and then there's a cardboard cutout of a policeman there as well. And it's just this idea of does that really help? What value is that adding? Does it actually, is it stopping theft in the shop? I really wonder if they've really thought about the value that adds, or at what point does it start to make things worse? Do they keep adding cardboard cutout policemen until you know, theft drops to zero? Or does actually that stop shoppers coming into the shop? There's that tipping point that we have to understand. And that question of actually what if past a certain point, you know, adding more security makes things less secure? And we know that with websites as well. You know, we add captures and we add logins, and it's actually at what point does adding all this stuff to try and make things secure and robust actually stop people accessing our services and making them open so everybody can access them. And um, this really leads me on. So the idea of fraud and deception and how we design for that is obviously quite a big deal in somewhere like the Department of Work and Pensions. We're basically, we're giving people money, so we're, people are applying for financial support. So it's this idea of what if past a certain point actually adding this complexity, so adding more content, adding more features, adding more security clearance, is actually going to leave a transaction open to fraud and deception, or more open to fraud and deception. And to think about this, I came up with this illustration of a circle of mistrust. And the thing we were seeing again and again doing user research is actually this thing that users seem to distrust government, especially when it comes to applying for welfare and benefits. And a lot of this came down to the fact that actually they felt that the government distrusted them. And because the government distrusts users, actually what happens is uh, users distrust government. And you see this circle. So, and government really gets into this circle for this reason. So I'll give you an example. So if we think about content, what happens quite a lot is somebody's applying for, somebody like, for something like carer's allowance. And they're a little bit guarded with the information they give. Maybe they don't answer all the questions or they're careful about what they tell us. 
And the way we counteract that is a government transaction. So we sit down in government, we think, actually, we need to know more information. People are withholding information. So what we do is we add more questions. We add kind of more, more repetitive questions. We try and get more information by doing more. And because of that, users get really suspicious about the types of questions we're asking them. They get really suspicious about the repetitive nature of the questions. They get suspicious about how we're asking the questions. And because of that, you get this receptacle mistrust. And really, we found that just adding more questions, which is what we were doing a lot of the time to try and deal with this, was actually making the problem worse. And again, this is something I've written about, and the big challenge really is we need to try and find ways to trust users so they can grow in confidence. We start to mutually build trust between us as government and them as users, and that way people are going to grow in confidence to use digital services independently. Vulnerable people who maybe wouldn't be comfortable online using digital services might be more comfortable to do these types of transactions online, which is what we want because we've designed them to be clearer, faster, and better services. And the big question is really, what can we do to rebuild trust with users? What can we do to reverse that cycle of mistrust? So a really good example is just like optional questions. We've hit this quite a lot, and this is something we've seen on different government transactions. So just having optional questions we found on something like a carer's allowance application really confused people. If I'm applying, I'm trying to make a case for financial support, it's a case of really, do they need that information or don't they? And people were almost thinking some of these questions are trick questions. It was actually, we were making them optional, so they weren't blockers, they weren't stopping people to get through the transaction. But really, it created this ambiguity, and anything ambiguous just causes this mistrust. So the way we try and deal with that now is to only ask questions if we need to. We, are, we either need to ask them and they're mandatory or we don't, but it's about asking the right questions rather than trying to redesign some of the ones we've got. We spent a lot of time trying to redesign optional questions so it was more clear that you know, they weren't trick questions, that they were optional, they were just things that it was helpful to know. But really it's just about just ask what you absolutely have to. Another area I've thought about with mistrust and has you know, been really important as well is just how we think about things like disclaimers and consent and declarations. So this is actually a real quote, and we, we get user satisfaction feedback, which is where that KPI for the, the satisfaction score and the kind of metrics that matter comes from. And somebody said to us the other week, you know, I did feel scared of hearing about the legal stuff at the end. And it's not that I'm trying to falsify anything. I really hate anybody to think that. And we get this a lot. And it's like people aren't trying to deceive us, but we make things like consent and declaration forms really complex, and they can be really legal. But it causes that mistrust. And actually, we know that on something like carer's allowance, you can see these figures online, they're live on gov.uk, um, four to five percent of people are dropping out at the end of a transaction when they get to this legal types of content. And it's about what if we could rewrite these pages in plain English? What if we could reassure people? Because actually, most of these people don't need to drop out. They're just being scared away by not understanding what we're saying to them. And what if we could rewrite it to be clear and concise? And really, that's the ch challenge of designing with security and fraud in mind. So really, coming to the end, I just wanted to think about and just bring together this challenge that actually, I think starting with too much is a bad strategy. So I alluded to that a little bit with the content before, of just going into user research with too much content when we're testing products. And when we're thinking about design content or features, I think the thing we've got to be careful of is if we go out with a, lots of content, lots of features, we end up focusing on what people like rather than what people need. There's a danger that we, we take our latest feature out and we find out that people like it rather than they need it. And one of the things I've learned on the projects I've worked on for the last 14 months is actually it would have been better not to have built or designed some of those features in the first place if we've actually understood the user needs. And the opportunity, I think, in building good products is in finding what's missing. So really, we need to start with less and iterate. And it, really, it's about finding out that we know we're building the right thing in the first place as well. And a good way of kind of bringing that together is just that we need to understand that what people say and what they do are very different. So I think we're going to hear more about this today, how to do user research in the right ways. And a great example is Dyson. James Dyson famously said, uh, there was an interview a couple of years ago, uh, people didn't want to see the dirt when we talked to them. So the, the Dyson vacuum cleaners, they've all got these see-through bins. I'm sure you've, a lot of you have got one. I've got one at home. But you can see the dust as it collects. And all the market research said people wouldn't want it. It's this thing of actually what people say and that what they'll buy is very different. And James Dyson said at the time, I couldn't prove that people would buy this product. But we know now that people have grown to love that product. 
And actually, DICE are a really good example of a product that focuses on function. It focuses around need. And actually, they've kind of become beautiful and accepted as kind of really good industrial design in our homes. So it really comes down to, and I said I'd talk about a couple of design principles. This is the last one I'm going to mention today, which is do the hard work to make it simple. And really, to, to do less, we do have to do the hard work. It's easier to add stuff than it is to remove stuff. It's easier to keep designing rather than trying to understand the underlying complexity or trying to get to the real problem. And it's this idea of unless you care enough, actually, you're not really going to do that hard work. And I think we have to try and work hard to deal with the underlying complexity, especially when it comes to policy-driven kind of transactions in government. We have to try and understand how things work. We have to get the right people in the room to work with them. And really, with something like Carers Allowance, I mentioned that it's vastly improved. We've actually removed 49% of the questions on that transaction now since we started. And, and that only comes from really trying to understand how the whole thing works, how it's linked into policy, and actually how we can really deliver something that is starting to meet user needs in a much better way. I mean, the way we get there is empathy. And it's not easy to get things done, but really, if we can start with empathy, it helps. And this is the thing why it's so important to start with user needs. You have to care. You have to be able to put yourselves in the shoes of users. So it is a case of, on something like uh, any of these services, like Carers Allowance, for example, you have to be able to ask yourself, so what if I needed financial support to be a full-time carer? Or what if it was my child with a disability? Or, you know, it was my parents with Alzheimer's? If we can start with that position, I think we start to design better services. And really, I just wanted to say, I think the, the biggest challenge I wanted to make, really, is just think about if you can remove barriers before you design solutions. So actually, if we can do that, I think we start to build products and services that will help people get on with their lives. I think we need to design with real-life outcomes in mind. And it's almost about thinking about the experience element of user experience as actually what happens in life as the outcome, not just the experience of the product itself. And I think that's it, really, removing barriers before we design solutions. So I just wanted to say, just to finish, that um, it was part of my new role. We're building a digital hub up in Leeds. Um, so we're now starting to look at building a really good resource to build and develop these projects. So if you're interested, we're hiring. We're hiring across a broad range of roles across research and design. So do come and talk to me today. It's been fantastic speaking to you. So uh, thank you for listening.